All right, welcome everybody. It's David, I'm here, I made it. Because you guys are actually like gambling on this stuff, I said, well, why don't I just blow everybody's mind and wear not blue, not whatever other colors you were expecting, but pink, yes, yes, to show one's true manhood. One must embrace the pink that can be worn. For it is only then that the true core of masculinity is discovered when the hard outer shell has been cracked that had formed around it. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm in a really good mood this week, folks, and I've got a really great show for you. Let's just make sure that everybody, uh, okay, you're talking about pink shirts and you're all happy. That's good. That means we're on the air. Ooh, it's been a great week. Uh, we had fantastic developments occur with the company. Um, basically, we passed due diligence. We're now on track for capital that might even satisfy all of our needs. They're talking about down the road doing an IPO. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do that or not. We didn't really ever want it to be public. And part of that is because we're developing this weird secret technology. But I wanted to get into these very uh, contentious topics where I can't tell you any of this because it's classified. Ah, come on, really? This is a big deal. Actually, I have learned a whole lot of things over the years that have made me convinced that the real story, what's really going on out there is so much bigger than we think. And there's some very, very interesting and strange stuff that's, that, that, that there is to know. And this isn't anything new. This is a process that's been going on for a very long time. So I wanted to, somebody was asking on the comments if I was gonna talk again about the horrible trip that I had to Los Angeles, no. Uh, a lot of people were asking about more dietary advice based on the last show. I didn't really plan on going into diet in this show. I like to have a little variety, and it's been a while since I was on the air. I spent two years working on Michael Prophecies, but now I'm at the point where I feel very comfortable with what's happening in the world in light of what Michael said in these books. This is Archangel Michael, and again, if you don't know my background, it starts out in college. So let's go to that slide where I was a student and I started to have these very fascinating pieces of information coming my way from a friend of mine whose physics professor was the head of the department. And this friend was arguably the best student in the class. He was really loved by the professor. They had private student teacher conferences together to talk about physics. And he, you know, was just a very bright kid who was really happy to get more information on topics that the rest of the class was quite done and satisfied at the end of the two-hour lecture. <clears throat> what we learn from this head of the physics department was that all of the modern niceties that we have regarding things like computer chips, fiber optics, Teflon, Velcro, LED lights, all these weird, interesting technologies, but again, computer chips being one of the most important ones, and lasers, actually, all apparently came from crashed disks that were real. And therefore, you start finding out that, oh, well, Roswell, which I'd already heard about by this point, and I guess it was 1993, <clears throat> Roswell was real. And, you know, there's a lot of chatter around that. None of the Roswell stuff adds up because the first thing they did announce to the public on the headline was that they found a flying saucer. And it's pretty unequivocal when you make that type of a declaration. And everybody was very saucer crazy because the Kenneth Arnold sightings had only occurred mere weeks before. The Kenneth Arnold sightings were only 10 days before the Roswell crash. And this was where the term flying saucer got coined and he was seeing objects of very high speed that looked like flying saucers over Mount Rainier in Washington State. And this electrified the country, and then all of a sudden we have one of them crash very soon after the term had just been invented and everybody started talking about it. 
Then they tried to say it was a weather balloon. Then they tried to say, oh, it's Project Mogul. And there were little dummies inside that looked like humans. But, oh, don't worry, it was all just a military test. Nothing extraterrestrial really ever happened. I was talking to a member of our board recently, and he was telling me a UFO story that was very incredible. He had a sighting of something that was so big that it covered the entire sky. It was all dark. He couldn't really make out any uh, appearance of, of differentiation on the surface, but it was so big that it blacked out the sky and it apparently went down into a lake that was near this resort property that he was staying at on, in Texas on the coast near Louisiana, actually is where this was. So he had tried to tell some other folks about this UFO sighting and they were resolutely against hearing anything about it because, oh, well, I believe in the Bible. You got to go to BibleRealityCheck.com, as I've said before, where you'll then find writings about how, yeah, you know what? There's references to flying saucers and angelic human extraterrestrials all over the place in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible is this incredible catalog of contact experiences. And this is not something that is often talked about. People don't think it's Christian necessarily to associate UFOs with anything positive. There's been this very strange and sad bias to try to make the entire UFO question something that's very dark and ominous and scary and, you know, not at all healthy for humanity. And I get that. I know there's a lot of xenophobia. I know there's a lot of fear in our past about UFOs and about extraterrestrial life and who they are and where they came from and all this. But I started to discover that, wait a minute, it's not even a theoretical question anymore. We've had things like Roswell. These are real. These are crashes of actual extraterrestrial hardware. And I say to myself, well, this is, this is really incredible. I mean, what, what are we learning about the universe besides the fact that we got, okay, LED lights, computer chips, Teflon, Velcro, uh, infrared night vision, laser beams. I mean, that right there is the only reason why we have the ability to do this show right now and stream it live online. If we didn't have that UFO endowment, this wouldn't have happened in time, and we would have had controlled centralized media where the only voice you get to hear is the one they want you to hear. But now you have your options, you have choices in place, and that's a good thing. So here we are talking about this technology while also using it. And that's what's so ironic is that these extraterrestrials did not just appear theoretically in old scriptures. They're appearing in modern times and they're giving us incredible hand-me-downs. They're giving us Christmas gifts that are of vast significance in terms of giving us a better life <clears throat> and a life in which we can actually have the freedom and autonomy to say what we want to say, to speak our minds, and to have this type of contact with each other. This ability for communication is, is wonderful. I love live streaming. By the way, let's read, <laughs> if I dare, if I dare, let's read some comments. Heather Cross says, I'm so happy to see you again. It's just wonderful. I missed you while you're away. Sending you love and light, my friend. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Namaste, David. My best thoughts, wishes, and love are for you and with you always. It's more likely crashed human-made hardware. Well, there's definitely some, there's definitely a lot of human-made stuff out there, but the original stuff was clearly not anything that was made by us. Uh, back at the time of Roswell, there's no way that we could have done something like this. And when you get into the slides and you start to hear about the things that various insiders were telling me, the story becomes very, very compelling and interesting. And it just keeps getting more interesting and more compelling as time goes on. Let's just move that a little bit. So I'm very excited to be here today because there's so much going on right now in the world. And I see it building up to a mass disclosure event that is much bigger than anything we could have imagined. Uh, this is a really intrinsic point here that I've heard from all of my different insiders, and that is that we are not alone in the universe. The stuff that you see that was built 
10,000 years ago that looks like a decaying stone monument, these higher level extraterrestrials could have done it just now. They're outside of time, they travel through time. They're not bound by any type of linearity as we would normally think of it. And so if they wanted to go back 10,000 years and say, you know, we forgot about that, we ought to build another pyramid over here. They could do it 10,000 years ago and we would never know the difference because for them it just happened and for us, it's always been there. So this type of time travel is one of the things that our own scientists discovered these flying saucers will naturally do. Things like the Roswell crash, when you actually get to start piloting them, you find out that, wow, they actually are also time machines. And in fact, the Germans called their first saucer project Kronos because of its command over time. So this is really interesting stuff. <clears throat> and the disclosure breakthroughs I had in college really got me started. But then what really took off was when I saw the Disclosure Project in 2001. So let's be clear that in 2001, uh, I had already been online for five years looking for UFO information. I'd listened to Richard C. Hoagland and Art Bell, and he was always talking about the face on Mars. And so I was entirely convinced that there was a face on Mars that was actually artificially generated to look like a human face. It's not a natural mountain. It's not a weird trick of light and shadow because not only does it look like a human face that has a headdress around it, a very clear headdress on both sides, it's very symmetrical. It has two eyes, it has a nose, it has a mouth, and it's sitting there a mile wide on the floor of the mesa around this whole area of Mars. Then right next to it is a city of what looks like four-sided Egyptian pyramids. And then immediately to the south is the so-called Di Petro and Molinar or DNM pyramid. And that one is actually five-sided. It looks like a pentagonal type of shape. But what's even more interesting is that the shape of the pyramid is not a perfect pentagon. It's distorted in the shape of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man which means that it precisely illustrates the proportions of the human body, which strongly suggests that people with human bodies built that pyramid. But wait, there's a problem. It's on a dead old planet. And so part of the scholarship that Hoagland was talking about was the exploded planet hypothesis. The idea that, okay, maybe the asteroid belt is not something that was always there. Maybe before it was asteroids, it was actually a planet and the planet blew up. So Richard C. Hoagland went through this in great detail. This was a big thing. If you listen to Art Bell in the late 90s, we're talking about Dr. Thomas Van Flandren and the exploded planet hypothesis. <clears throat> you can take all the comets in our solar system, the dirty ice snowballs. Turns out that's the ocean that came off of this planet. Then you look at the asteroids and you have all of the different components that you would expect to see in the mantle, in the core, in the crust, all the different layers of the Earth are represented in the Jovian asteroids. So are they really just asteroids or was there something there before that? Well, it appears that there was a planet there before that and it appears that Mars was in a gravitational capture with this. So Mars actually has this weird tidal distribution where the tides, there's more water that appears on each side of the planet around the equatorial regions, not the polar regions. There's these groupings of water on either side that can be seen in the location of water ice today. And so Richard C. Hoagland worked with the great Mike Barra, who's an awesome researcher, and together the two of them came out with this captured moon hypothesis where there was a planet, it was Earth-like, it was probably inhabited by humans, that's what we hear from all these insider reports, and there was a war that led to this planet being destroyed. And again, Mars would have looked like another watery Earth up in the sky, it would have been a moon, but instead of our moon, which is all dead and dry and gray, this would be a really beautiful blue jewel in the night sky. And some people have ancestral memories of places like this, and it shows up in a lot of visionary artwork that you find online. 
But in this case, I'm really talking about something that happened in our solar system that may very well have been talked about in movies like Star Wars. And Star Wars could very well be some type of documentary only loosely disguised. That's one of the things that I really covered in Michael Prophecies is that George Lucas was apparently drawing off of a lot of 1950s contactee information when he made Star Wars. And this includes the idea of Archangel Michael with his sword of light, which becomes the Jedi, and they have their lightsabers. The, old, the whole idea of the Jedi being in some type of galactic alliance is very much related to what the Law of One calls the Confederation of Planets in service of the One Infinite Creator. And then all the stuff with Darth Vader and the fact that he's got the Death Star and all those kinds of themes about a dark empire that wants to rule through dominance and force, that's all part of our history because apparently this planet that blew up, it had a variety of different names. One of the names was Lucifer. And so the idea that the planet blew up in Orfeo Angelucci's material in particular, which I have in book four of Michael Prophecies, have some extended quotes from there, which I can use because it all was written in the 1950s, so it's all fair use now. Copyright expired. But it doesn't matter. The stuff is so amazing. And we find out that this planet was called Lucifer. That's one of the names. And the fallen angels and the concept of Lucifer falling from heaven is apparently a loose analogy of this planet actually exploding. And in the Law of One, they explain that the people who came from this planet, which they call Maldek in the Law of One, they steered away from the Lucifer thing entirely. But Maldek's inhabitants had to apparently reincarnate here on Earth as the Neanderthals. That was a karmic alleviation that they had to go through for blowing up their planet. Now, there's a whole very interesting history about this that I didn't find out about until I was into book six of Michael Prophecies. And again, you got to remember, I've spent two years doing nothing but writing these books as fast as I can because there was prophecies in them that are highly relevant to everything we're seeing now. The geopolitical tension in the world has never been higher. It's a very dark and disconcerting time. But not once you find out what's really going on here and what has been what we've really been dealing with. So Richard C. Hogan was the next big step, as I was saying, and that was a whole fascinating learning curve having to do with things like, wow, was there an exploded planet? And was there a civilization on that planet? And did this civilization also exist on Mars? And is that why we have the face and the uh, pyramids? And the answer appears to be yes. So as we get disclosure, as we get the truth, one of the most exciting things that we're going to find out is that Mars isn't even the only example. There's architecture all over our solar system. We don't even need to leave the solar system to find this stuff. And one of the insiders I met through Hoagland, who I call Bruce, told me that the craft that were within the realm of whatever space program he was working with could not leave the solar system, that we were trapped within the solar system. But he said it doesn't even matter because what we have here is these ancient ruins on multiple satellites, planets, and uh, moons and asteroids. And these are glass-like ruins. They're obelisks. They are pyramids. They are domes. And if you have a glass-like dome and you put people in there underneath, you could pressurize it and you could have an atmosphere and turn it into a Garden of Eden. You could have plants and trees and everything is beautiful and green and flowing. And moons have so much water ice in them, all you got to do is melt the ice and you have millions of years worth of drinkable water for your little ecosystem that you built there. The key material within our own periodic table to do this is a metal. It's aluminum, apparently. And so we're going to be using transparent aluminum to do this. And this ironically shows up in one of the Star Trek films. I believe it's Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And I show that to you in, in this uh, spaceship movie that I made, which right now is held on private, by the way. Vimeo's finally figured out how to dock your videos if you have something they don't like. So I have to replace some music in that movie. Anyway, it's a fascinating thing that's going on. Because we're looking at 
the ancient past and we're looking at the fact that, hey, this transparent aluminum seems to have been used to build domes and underground square-like build-outs all over our solar system. They're still there. So when we get disclosure and we start building some spaceships, there is archaeology like you cannot imagine. And one of the things that I found that really made me angry, actually, was talking to Hoagland's top insider, again, this guy, Bruce, and they did have a falling out at some point over an asteroid story that turned out to not be entirely truthful. So you have to be careful. Some of these insiders are going to throw you disinformation. And that happened to Richard, and he had a falling out with this guy, which is why in 2007, Richard and Bruce weren't really talking when I was at Richard's event as a speaker, and Bruce approached me privately. And then I found out who he was, and it was very exciting. But that's later in our insider timeline here, and I don't want to go on forever either. So Disclosure Project came next, and this was where, okay, I've already heard about that there's glass-like pyramids, domes, obelisks all over the solar system. I've already heard about there's great stuff waiting for us uh, on Mars. And then um, the next thing was that, you know, somebody you could consider to be a competitor to Richard C. Hoagland, which would be Dr. Stephen Greer at the time, came out with the Disclosure Project. And I really do want to give full credit for just how utterly amazing this was. Dr. Greer came out in May 9th, 2001 with 39 new insiders who nobody would ever heard from before. Or maybe there had been some exposure of them before, but it had been minimal. He had done a previous event in 1996 or 95. It was just before I got involved, so I didn't get to see that one. But the Disclosure Project event had 39 different people, and each one of them you could double-click on, and it just goes way, way far. So that was very exciting to me. And in that talk, he had Dr. Carl Wolf, and Carl Wolf was reporting on working, I believe, in some type of capacity for the NSA. And then he got into a room that he apparently didn't have clearance to be in, and he saw these pictures of these objects on the moon that were buildings. And he asked someone there what, what it was, and the person, you know, told him that you're not supposed to talk about this, and, and he got threatened, and he, he, he had a really bad experience, and ended up expecting to see it on the news and then never saw anything. But again, what he was seeing was highly detailed constructions on the moon, and then... Dr. Greer also had Donna Hare, who was saying that they were regularly airbrushing imagery out of NASA photographs, such as buildings on various planets and satellites, such as Mars, such as the Moon. They have objects on them, they have buildings on them, and there was a whole team in NASA of the airbrush team, and their job is just to get rid of all that stuff. Then Richard C. Hoagland came out with Ken Johnston, who had the originals from a set of Apollo photographs that were not digitally altered, like Donna Hare was saying. And in Ken Johnston's original photographs, we start to find all of the cool stuff on the moon that NASA didn't want you to see. And this included some very, very stunning buildings, some domes. There was a bullet-shaped dome that was very striking. There was kind of a strange L-shaped building that was clearly artificial. And again, they were whiting these out of the originals. They were airbrushing over them as best they could so you couldn't see what this was. So we had all this even before Disclosure Project. Then Disclosure Project brings out a new guy, Dr. Carl Wolf, who's saying, yeah, I saw these things on the moon as well. So that's what you get corroborating testimony. Two different insiders starting to tell you the same thing is what happens when you begin getting closer and closer to the truth. People's stories begin lining up and they begin matching. Disclosure Project was also singularly unique for bringing out Sergeant Clifford Stone, who asserted that he was on a ET UFO crash retrieval program where they were actually going to the site where UFOs crashed, disks had landed or whatever the object looked like, and there was beings in there that might be dead and they might still be alive. Uh, Sergeant Stone reported working with someone he called the Colonel, and the colonel would tell him about this field manual. He was allowed to look at it. It was three inches thick. And in the field manual, 
was all the detailed information they had on 57, are you ready for this? 57 different varieties of extraterrestrials currently visiting the Earth. They called them the Heinz 57 as a weird homage to the ketchup. But this was true, the Heinz 57, 57 different varieties of ETs living on Earth. But what was even stranger was that these ETs predominantly looked human. And this is something that I've now heard from many other insiders as well. They looked predominantly human. Some of them had larger eyes. Some of them had the eyes that looked black, but some of the larger eyes definitely were not black. Many of them were hairless, uh, not all of them. There was one type that we talk about in my new show, uh, Sacred Science and Michael Prophecies, which is at https colon slash slash thedisclosure.com. That's where all the Michael stuff I'm talking about, the books and the videos are all located. A Yeti, a Wookiee type of ET was one of the 57, uh, uh, <laughs> a very hairy humanoid that apparently might be here on Earth showing up as Bigfoot, but we don't realize that he's a lot smarter than we thought, and it's actually a sentient extraterrestrial species that might be spending time living on and within the Earth's inner caverns, ironically enough. So you can't make this stuff up. Some of it is just so bizarre and hilarious, and that always is enjoyable for me. There was another guy in Disclosure Project who at first uh, had a, a different name, and then he ended up, I think the name that he finally used was Dan Salter. And his book is pretty fascinating. He was out there and was one of these people who's intended to go and rough you up if you invent anti-gravity or free energy. And you, you find out this has been happening all along. People keep inventing this stuff. There's ET assistance, some type of te telepathy or dream activity that happens to them. They're all excited. They think they're going to change the world. They think they're going to become a billionaire. They get a big ego. And the next thing you know, you get the game called gold or lead. Now, what do you think gold or lead means? Well, you can either take this gold or we're going to fill you full of this lead. Which one do you want? That's the real world. The real world is that there is something going on that is so big and it is so secret that you're not allowed to know about it. And Disclosure Project was the next thing that really gave me a stunning view into where all this was going. And then after that, after Disclosure Project, I was at LNL Research, and this began in 2003. And in December 2003, we had my first high-level insider move in with us and become a permanent resident at LNL Research. So this was Daniel. And as I revealed three years ago, but I'll do it again because I want to go over these slides again, his real name was Dr. Bruce Perrette. So this was a picture of him while he was working as a security guard. And this is a kind of blurry picture of him off his website. And this is another picture of him where you can kind of get a better sense of his face. I really did enjoy hanging out with Bruce Perrette. He was the best. And we lived together because I was happy to pay all the expenses for the rent as long as he kept telling me what the heck was going on in these inside government programs that he was working on. And boy, did he tell me a whole bunch of stuff. He told me that he worked on something called the Phoenix 3 Project from 1981 to 1983. And what exactly is the Phoenix 3 Project? Well, this got into a very contentious part of the UFO literature, which I had always wanted to kind of stay away from up until then, and that was uh, Nichols and Moon's classic book, uh, The Montauk Project. And I'm thinking to myself, this Preston Nichols guy, I don't know. It's just, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. They're trying to say that they used a SAGE radar system on Montauk Point, Long Island, that it was, they were able to turn this uh, radar unit, which is a really big banana-shaped dish aerial, into some type of directed energy thing that had huge effects on consciousness and could cause people to, you know, act differently, this kind of stuff. So they were apparently messing around with this SAGE radar and getting these very strange effects. And then if you read the book, which now appears to be predominantly an accurate disclosure, I don't know about any of the ones after the first one, but definitely the first one was, was bang on, according to, to Dr. Bruce Perrette. 
that they had a Roswell type of crash. There's been a number of them. They've got these recovered disks that they've kept in storage in places like warehouses, like Area 51. And sure enough, they took the seats out of one of these craft. They hooked up the seat to a power supply and they found out that the seat itself is a time machine. All you need is just the chair. The chair is intended to create a psychic interface with the person sitting in the chair such that your mind now has the ability to become a navigator through space and time. You can think your way through space and time. It's as if your body becomes elevated into a higher level of humanity, some type of ascended state, some type of extraterrestrial, more advanced type of, of what we're going to become as human evolution continues. So he talked about how there was a guy that would sit in the chair and they'd have to have him go into a meditation. He'd go into something called quiet point. This is where you have no thoughts. You're trying to get into a very, very still place in your mind. And then from that quiet point within you, they then have these 22 sine wave graphs. They zero them out with knobs. And when they get them all flat, so that instead, like an oscilloscope, it doesn't look like a curve anymore. It just looks like a straight line. When you get to that point, now what you have is a zeroed out chair. And then you can tell the chair operator where to think about in space and in time. And when he or she, I guess it was always men in this case, when he thinks about where it's going to go, thinks about a particular place in time where you could send someone, sure enough, a portal opens up in the room and you can see a hole through space and time that would take you to that location. So Bruce talked about being in the cafeteria and one of the first signs that he had that there was something very strange going on with his job was that there were mirages that would appear on the wall. And all of a sudden, you're looking at the wall of the cafeteria, and you already know the kitchen is right on the other side. There should be just a bunch of stainless steel shelving and pots and pans everywhere. But instead of seeing a bunch of stainless steel, you're seeing this weird meadow in another time and place. And it's right there, like you could just walk right through the wall and go into this meadow. Well, it turns out if you do walk through that thing, you will end up in the meadow. And you're not coming back <laughs> unless they go and get you and they know what they're doing. So they were messing around with this recovered UFO technology. And this was what he called Phoenix 3. There was Phoenix 1, where they first figured out some of the technical problems to get it working. And then at the end of Phoenix 1, they fired everybody so that those guys who knew how to build it were not involved in the next step. Phoenix 2, they built it out to the point where Bruce came in. And then at the end of Phoenix 2, they fired all of those guys. So now they bring in a new group of guys, and those guys don't know anything about how any of it was built or where it came from, or if somebody turned into spaghetti and this gross death happened, they don't know any of that stuff. All they know is they've been brought in, here's the technology, and here's what you do. Sit in this chair, watch these dials, you know, add these things up and give us the answer. So what Bruce ended up finding out over time was through talking to the janitor at this place, he found out that, yeah, they have been traveling through time and space using this seat from a UFO, which now is colloquially in ufology called the Montauk chair. And again, getting back to the slides, uh, Bruce was so amazed by what they had told him that he ended up dedicating his whole life to the study of the physics of time travel. And so here he is on the Reciprocal System Theory website, uh, and this is a biography. It says, Dr. Bruce Perrette retired as the current director of research, has a comprehensive background in computer science, electrical engineering. He worked for several multinational corporations over the span of half a century. From 1991, he's involved in the research and teaching of Reciprocal System Theory developed by Dewey Larson, and it goes on from there. So as I said, he came to L Research in December 2003, and he insisted on an elaborate cover story to hide his identity. And we lived together from October 2004 through January 2006. And we did this, we lived at, after the first year or so, we ended up living in Milton, which was this really, really backwater part of Kentucky. Uh, next to their land, they called Avalon. There was... 
Something you can't quite duplicate about going into a store in Kentucky on the border of Indiana, and you walk in there, and the cigarette smoke is so thick that it curls around you as you walk into the store, like a store that's just a corner store. It literally was like, I mean, you had to literally take off all your clothes as soon as, not in the store, but as soon as you got home, where did you get that from? When you got home, you had to take off your clothes because they stank so much, and I would actually just have to wash them immediately. So thankfully, there were stores in Indiana that weren't like that, but the stores around Milton, you walk in there, the smoke is just, whew, it was so nasty. I cannot tell you how nasty that was. So while we were hanging out together, I interviewed him hundreds of times about Montauk, and we were speaking about it every day, and we watched a variety of TV shows together. We watched... Uh, Charmed was one of the ones that he said had a lot of weird cabal stuff in it. Um, so we went through all the Charmed episodes. But then two that he both felt were loaded with disclosure was Stargate SG-1 and Babylon 5. And again, he said both were loaded with disclosure. Now, in Babylon 5, there was something called the Psy Corps. And he wasn't sure if that's what it really was, but he had talked about this, the idea of teeps and teeks. And that is a telepath, or TP, and a telekinetic, or TK. So what, he, what I found out was that he had been invited into a program that was, we called it the CIA Psychic Training Program, but it was probably also called PSYCOR. And PSYCOR, if we'll use that name, was a program that would teach people to become assassins either telepathically or telekinetically. That's essentially what they wanted to get out of it. If you were a telekinetic assassin, you could be assassinated by the pinching of the carotid artery in the neck, causing a constriction of blood flow to the brain. If the brain doesn't get oxygen for 60 seconds, you die. So that was apparently the goal of the teeks. And then the goal of the teep or telepath would be to get some, influence someone to do it to themselves. And again, both of these techniques are, are straight ahead black magic. You should not ever do this unless your desire is to be tortured in the lower astrals, or what we would call hell. So then he told me that there was a, a score that you would get of a P0, which would be like an average person, through a P10. And a P10, as a teak, is a very powerful telekinetic. A P10 telepath is, again, very powerful. Apparently, even the best uh, channelers and natural psychics, no matter how good they were, these government programs had never been able to find anybody above a P4. That's what he said. So if you wanted to get P5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you had to go through this whole elaborate training program that they would run you through. And there was a lot of interesting things, and one of them was inverse calisthenics. They would have you hang upside down and do sit-ups upside down. And apparently what happens is that this causes... Over time, it causes greater and greater blood flow to the pineal gland. It actually expands the size of your pineal gland and causes it to become more activated. Another thing they talked about was mapping the dream landscape. They wanted you to remember your dreams and they wanted you to start sketching out where everything is in your dream. And they had this theoretical belief that the landscape of your dreams is fixed as you go through it, but what changes is the symbology of each portion of the landscape. Whoa, what did he just say? David, whoa. Okay, check it, I'll say it again. The, 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 the one of these is the, one of the main teachings that got people above P4, okay? You learn that your psyche is represented in three-dimensional symbolism in your dream. The dream is yourself. Every character you see, every building every area that you see, every environment that you run into is some type of dramatized symbol of yourself. And there is a set list of symbols in a set geographical location that apparently will stay consistent from one dream to the next, and this is called your dream landscape. So imagine now that you have this stage that's already been built and you have maybe seven objects on the stage, but these objects can change each time you run somebody on the stage through another play. Well, that's kind of the idea. The characters might change, the buildings might change, but it's their symbolism that remains intact, and they have absolute position in relative 
time space, which is your subconscious. So your subconscious has a representational landscape that is fixed. And what's also interesting in that same teaching is the arrow of time points in the direction that you're facing. So what does this mean? Let's say that in those seven objects that you put on your little stage, that you arrange them in a circle. <laughs> and that at the beginning of the circle, what you do is you start walking through and you encounter, let's say one of them looks like an evergreen tree, but you don't realize in the dream, the evergreen tree could be a bunch of other symbols as well, but it's always going to be right there. It's always going to be in that position. Now you walk through the seven items and they're in a circle and you think that you're moving forward in time. So you get to the end of the seven objects and now you're at the number one again. And now you have to run through the circle again, but to you, it appears that you're in the future. It doesn't appear that you've gone back to the beginning once again. And so this is actually a very interesting teaching that has to do with cycle science and the idea that, hey, what if time is not the same as we think it is? What if it's cyclical? And what if there are patterns of experiences and behavior that we have to go through as we move through these cycles? There are things that are going to affect us, and they're going to affect our planet, and they're going to affect our psyche and our spirit, and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. We're trapped, and we have to keep going through the psyche. And, and so this representational landscape of the psyche was the big trick. And he said that once you mastered this, you have a dark night of the soul. Once you start to understand and integrate what you're here for on earth, you have mastered your karma. The one other thing that was really important teaching wise was the union of opposites. They talked about this a lot. And, and it's not like the, some Illuminati thing. This is a very different concept than that. The idea being that you want to find all the balances in your psyche about everything. If, if you, you're looking for any objects, any situations in your life, you're d deliberately trying to find out, okay, what upsets me? What, what triggers me? What makes me angry? What makes me sad? What makes me afraid? What makes me happy? You know, you, you really start to learn about yourself and say, okay, where all these areas of negativity are, can I get to the core of what that is and then actually let go of it, which is really a forgiveness teaching. So that part of the psychor was beautiful, that you're going to go through your life and find all the pain and let go of it. But as you're letting go of it and as you study this material, you have the dark night of the soul, which is where the collapse of the old you comes face to face with the birth of the new you. And that collapse and rebirth process can be incredibly painful, incredibly horrific, and very difficult. So the idea is not to get tied up in the dark night of the soul, because here's what they said that was so fascinating in the psychor. There is a collapsing inward, which, which they call an implosion. So, so when you have a dark night of the soul, when you're really sad, when you're really depressed, you are imploding into yourself. And this apparently is a spiritual implosion of spiritual energy, which is very fascinating. There's a spiritual implosion. And at the point that the spiritual implosion occurs, there is an explosion into your dream landscape. But wait, it's like raisin bread. The dream landscape, if you think about raisin bread, right? When you first pour it into the pan, all the raisins are really close together. But as the bread rises, it becomes maybe two or three times bigger than that little line of batter at the bottom of the pan when you first started. And in the process, the raisins begin expanding apart from each other equally, filling up the whole raisin bread, you see. So apparently what happens when you have a dark night of the soul is that your dream landscape gets the raisin bread treatment and it actually expands. And so like for me, I, I, I actually found that this was true. He taught me something very strange and esoteric and I went back and looked at it and sure enough, it's true. I had this explosion in my dream landscape where now when I get trapped going back to my high school, the high school is huge. It's the same building, but it's gotten much, much bigger. So this will keep happening and as your dream landscape gets bigger and it expands like raisin bread, it does something raisin bread can't do, which is that new raisins also show up. And that's pretty freaking weird, and that's pretty freaking exciting, too. There's new raisins. So new raisin bread, new raisins.
Well, what are the new raisins? That means that there are new potentials in your soul. You might not have had the ability to do telekinesis before, but one of those objects in your dream landscape now is going to contain the key to unlock those capabilities or telepathy. And it could be many, many other things. There could be talents that you came here to develop and nurture. We are the creator. The law of one encourages all of us to be artists. That's the philosophical material that I've based my life's work on. If you haven't seen my other stuff, it's called the law of one. And the law of one was where I was when Bruce showed up. And then again, after, you know, half a year, we moved together to their land in Avalon. And he was very fascinated. So we were talking about all this stuff. And another thing that he kept showing me, you know, with the dream landscape is that this is you. Your soul transforms. You evolve into some new type of being, and it shows up in your dreams. Your dreams are now bigger and more exciting. And so when he actually was able to give me something that I was able to apply in practice, and then it turned out to be real, that was very, very impressive. So then he also told me that Stargate SG-1 was basically accurate, that they really are, there are teams of people apparently who are using these types of portal systems uh, to send people around. And he even told me about something called the ancient Stargate network. And uh, so this is fascinating. I, I revealed this three years ago. I held on to this for a really long time because I wanted to vet people out, see if anybody could find it. But our actual Stargate address here on Earth is 753-8470. 24606. And what that is, the universe is based on geometry. You're going to hear that in the new Sacred Science of the Michael Prophecies, a 10 and a half hour course I've got on thedisclosure.com. And we talk about how dodecahedrons exist in galaxies, dodecahedrons exist in solar systems. These are geometric objects, they look like a soccer ball with pentagonal faces. And there's 12 of those pentagons that make up this kind of spherical object. Well, the Stargate address is based on taking various regions of space and dividing it by 10. So again, when we go back to this list, each of the first three digits, 7, 5, and 3, are based upon tiling a galaxy or a larger sphere of space into 10 regions, which is very likely because of the dodecahedron. Then there are others that you tile into 100, and that's what we see in the second part. 84, 70, and 24 uh, would be an area that tiles up where you're taking the, the, the units of 10, and then you're chopping them into 10 subunits of equal distance. So that's what that basis is. And again, 84, 70, 24. I mean, even, I think even when you're down to the digit 70, you're still way the hell outside the Milky Way galaxy, folks. That is not the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, I think maybe, maybe by the time you get to 24, it's like there's 24, it's, we're in the 24th part of our galaxy. I think that's what it is. And then within that, they've divided it again. You see the last number is 606. That's a three, it's actually a four digit number. It could go up to a thousand, but apparently he said those are not based upon location. They are based upon an address system, much like a card catalog, that's when various planets need to get their social security number because they have intelligent human life on them. So within our region, there are 606 planets, or 605 planets before ours that got their own Stargate address. I have to keep drinking water fiendishly or I'm never going to make it through this. So the, how do we get to that? How do we get to the 606? Well, he said that 605 was Mars, 606 is Earth, and that these were built, these stargates were built by these ancient extraterrestrials that are all over the universe, not even just our galaxy. And, and I guess they were called the elders, or that's what he was calling them. The idea was that there are these fascinating beings that are very powerful, they're very advanced, and they go around and they build this natural Stargate network. And you send people through these, but the problem is that most people who go through these things are permanently damaged, you see. It's not a fun experience, but 
one of the things that he told me that was so fascinating was that DARPA apparently developed the IP address protocol that we use on the internet right now from studying these Stargate networks. They did an extensive investigation. So what you're seeing on Stargate SG-1 would be an example of this ancient Stargate in use. And you can't send any weapons through. You can't send anything through that's non-organic. So if you send somebody through and they have, for example, synthetic, uh, synthetic elastic, it's like a plastic that's holding up their pants, it's hilarious, but when you get out the other side of the Stargate, your pants might fall down. Now, is it actually in the shape of a ring? I don't know. He wasn't really clear on that, but it seemed like it was. And I've heard others who said that it was, and it might be a ring with obelisks on either side. That's possible. I've heard that before. The ring seems to be a pretty common element of the story. So how you dial it, the Stargate SG-1 show had a dialer. That appear, apparently is true. And again, it's all based on these numbers, 753, 84, 70, 24, 606 being our number. He also said that 605 Mars and then number one, 001, and you only have to type in the number one, would get you to a pulsar that was the home of a group of greys called the Aesir, A-E-S-I-R, and that they had also appeared as Thor in the Viking legends, and that Valhalla was actually this place around this pulsar at address number one. Another thing he said was that if you only want to travel around locally to like Mars or anywhere else, you only have to type in the three-digit number. You don't need the rest. You only have to build out the rest of the number based upon how far you actually want to travel. And again, most people who went through this thing had severe cognitive impairments. Uh, the, the Montauk system seemed to be much better. And that got into other insiders I met with later who said that there's an ancient Stargate system which nobody ever uses. I mean, they played around with it. They learned how to get it to work. But again, you can't bring any weapons with you. You come uh, only with the things that are organic that you have on your body. A lot of people tried to beat that. They tried to habituate to their gun. Nobody could do that. There's some type of intelligent system that prevents you from taking weapons. So it appears that the whole thing was intended for peaceful exploration. But they were so freaked out about who might come through our Stargate. They found one in Egypt, I guess in 1928. And that's all part of the Stargate show. That was all apparently true in the original movie. They buried it in Antarctica so that nothing could come through without being frozen to death. So that's the thank you that we have the welcome note on the front of the Earth house is don't come here because you're going to be frozen when you go through the gate. Well, that's kind of the mentality uh, of the military industrial complex. Now, as we were watching the show, there was one episode, as I said before, that really, really was just so crazy called Wormhole Extreme, in which they're basically making fun of themselves and they have a television show where the real Stargate team who's actually doing this for real, going through this ring, going to different planets, having these missions and coming back, that that real team is actually advising the creation of a television show called Wormhole Extreme, which is science fiction. And, they're, and at the end of every episode of Stargate, they say that the DOD was responsible for helping them with the show. That's really weird, huh? That's disclaimers at every episode. So then what they're doing is they're developing this whole show called Wormhole Extreme off of the real characters and the real people. So like the, the black guy, Teal'c, on the right there is now the silver-looking character. You have uh, Daniel Jackson, who shows up as the guy on the left. You have your goofy character. He shows up again. So when, they, when I watched Wormhole Extreme, I was like, whoa, man, this is just unbelievable. But according to... What he was telling me, you know, when you deal with these technologies that he had just gotten his foot in the, in the door with the Phoenix 3, Montauk, 1983, you know, he was there. He ended up getting welcomed into that program, and they were sending people through space and time. And that also got into the fascinating 2012 discussion, which was that when they sent you past December 21st, 2012, people had this experience of cosmic consciousness that was incredibly amazing that they called the full out. 
So the next really big advancement that came in my studies was the discovery of Dr. Pete Peterson. Uh, this was through the work of Kerry Cassidy and Bill Ryan from Project Camelot. They were out there beginning in 2006 interviewing various insiders. I was always concerned about them because they were so hungry for the truth that they didn't really have a good business model in place. And we talked about that a lot. Like, how can you monetize these videos? Because they were just releasing three, four hour long videos that were getting millions of views back when there was no ad revenue on YouTube, 2006, seven and eight and nine, you know, it, you didn't really make any money on this at all. So they ended up asking for donations. But by 2009, they'd been at it for three years. I'd already communicated with them before. We'd done videos together. And I'd already met, I believe by 2008 or so, maybe even 2007, I think it was 2007, I met Henry Deacon. So even before we talk about Pete Peterson, Henry Deacon was a massive leap forward. Here's a guy who got attracted to Project Camelot because they had stuff that wasn't part of the typical Disclosure Project material. Now, again, not to knock Dr. Greer, I was in love with the Disclosure Project material. It was fascinating, and I built everything off of those 39 insiders as if it was purely credible, because I believe that it was. I met them all in person. I could see that this was real. I got there on May 10th, 2001, and I stayed for the rest of the week, and I got to talk to everybody. So then when Henry Deacon came along, he was attracted by the fact that Camelot was getting new insiders, they had new information, and he had a story that was much weirder than everybody else who had ever come forward up until then. Henry Deacon was the weirdest, and I said, if this guy is real, I need to talk to him, and that's actually why I sought out Project Camelot in the first place. So I traded them my material on Montauk Daniel, and I gave them detailed videos and exclusives on this, it got lots of views. And then in exchange for that, they gave me access to Henry Deacon. And Henry Deacon ended up coming forward at the event that we did in Zurich in 2010. And that was stunning. He actually came forward on stage. He showed his passport, which was brown, not blue, even though it was an American passport. Passports aren't supposed to be brown. That was a diplomatic thing because of the job that he had. But his story, which he unfortunately didn't really want to get into on stage, and there's reasons why, they're told that they're gonna to be tortured to death if they ever talk. So that really scares people into not wanting to say anything. But here he was coming forward with me on the phone. I must've spoken to him for 80 or 90 hours. I mean, it was two, three times a week for two hours at a time for years. So add that up, whatever that is, that's what it was. And a lot of times he'd wanna gripe about the UFO community and, and his grievances and how nobody knew anything. And it was so, you know, and I'm like, okay, all right. You know, we talk about that at some degree but then I'd always try to get him back into the work. You know, what was it that you did? Well, his, his testimony was that he went to, I'm going to drop it on you now, Men With Hill. I've never said the name before, but it was Men With Hill, a British military base. He said he went to Men With Hill and that they went through this thing called the corridor. Now, it looks like just a, a round tunnel, but at the end of the tunnel, there's this elevator and it's got a circular door on it, apparently. And you put your, you, you, you go inside, it looks normal, and it'll actually take you up one floor, but it, the doors close very slowly. Once you get inside, it looks like a typical elevator. It has a typical console. And Henry Deacon said that he had a key, an ordinary earth-looking key, and then just a regular ID badge. It was actually a very special badge. It would tell you where you're going to go. You put your key inside this weird elevator, you turn it, the doors close very slowly, but then as soon as they close, you've traveled to wherever your key and your badge tells you to go, which in his case was a base on Mars. So he traveled to this base on Mars in which he said there was 200,000 personnel, but only 10,000 of them were born on Earth. And when, when I asked him what were the other people like, he said they looked like different types of humans. And, you know, so here he is parked his car at Menwith Hill in the parking lot. Seems like he's going into work on a typical military base. And believe me, I think this is happening all over the place. It's not just Menwith. It's all over the place. They park their car. They go to work. They go through something like this, and they end up off planet in a completely different location. They might work longer than the amount of time that they actually were gone, and then they return, and then they drive home. So you might actually be able to work for two weeks 
and then come back only like after an eight hour shift, let's say, something like that. So this was a very, very curious thing to talk to somebody about. And it was also frustrating because there were so many layers of depth of detail that he just would never give me. Like for example, I knew he was fixing some type of technical equipment that was on a variety of different bases that we had off planet. He talked about bases on the moon, bases on Mars, bases on other satellites in our solar system. There was some type of equipment that he was authorized to repair, but he didn't even want to tell me what the equipment was. And he said that his job was very boring because all he had to do is fix this stuff and there really was nothing else to do. And so he said that he spent most of his time playing ping pong when he was on these bases. So this was a very, very fascinating game changer because he talked about being in the uh, sub shuttle system, as it's called, on Mars and that you're going through these glass tubes and that sometimes they'd be exposed to the outside and you'd see these canyons that are much, much better than the Grand Canyon going by. Just this jaw-droppingly amazing, amazing stuff. Ancient ruins, they, they had visited the pyramids, they've explored that stuff. But everybody would say, you know, there's so much that we haven't even looked at yet. That's why once we get disclosure, I want to get people out there. I want to build craft and get people out there because we have tons and tons of archaeology to do. There's enough jobs in archaeology for everybody on Earth who wants to do it to make amazing discoveries and you get credit because you're now Leakey or you're now Dr. Thomas Leakey, right? Or, or you're now, uh, you know, some expert paleontologist because you're the one who went over to this asteroid and found this amazing frickin' ancestral vault that they had there that turns on, every all the lights come on when you walk into the room and it shows you this holographic replay of their civilization. But we might not have found that thing yet. You might be the one who finds that thing, you see? That's why I don't think millennials are going to have a problem working once we get these jobs online. Once we show you what you can do, how much stuff there is inside the earth that still needs to be explored, the fact that the moon in some levels has 10,000 floors of habitable space, it's mostly filled with these large dead bodies of the people who were there before that got blown up. There was a huge civilization inside the moon and up to 10,000 floors deep. So I'm very excited about where this is all going. And then the Henry Deacon thing, he never saw reptilians, but there, were, there was one group that would only wear masks when they came into the room. And in context, that definitely appeared to be the reptilians, but he was talking predominantly about having meetings with other types of humans. You know, they'd have different colored skin, pink skin, yellow skin, there's blue, there's green, all the pastel colors you can think of, there's somebody out there with that color of skin who's more or less human. Well, then the next person after, you know, two years of Henry Deacon and just trying to get every last shred of intel out of him that I possibly could, I'd, I'd really hit it about as far as I could go. Uh, and then I found Dr. Pete Peterson. And so Peterson was the next really, really big stunning advancement forward because he essentially was validating everything that Henry Deacon was saying. And apparently he worked in various agencies like the DIA. Uh, he'd actually worked for the CIA, NSA, and DIA, which is apparently nearly impossible, but just the result of where he'd been, what he'd done. But Pete's testimony just got even weirder than anything I'd already heard. Now, it's also important that I got into this whole conversation about how much there is that we don't know. And Peterson started to really clarify. He said we have over 225, I forget how many it was, 225 underground civilizations, underground cities here on Earth that were built by the military industrial complex. 225. What does that mean? That means there's these massive caves underground that could be like 30 miles wide and they would go in there and they would build them out. They would develop them because it turns out they have breathable air. They have this weird phospholuminescent bacteria that grows along the roof. It's clearly intelligent design. So when you go into these places, there's these creatures that look like the white uh, crustaceans from the Mariana Trench, mushrooms, all this kind of stuff. It's all white. 
there's this dim luminous glow from this natural phospholuminescent bacteria that grows on the on the roof of these inside of these domes inside the earth and they actually create oxygen that you can breathe so you go into this place and you're breathing air and you're seeing things and it's all these weird little creatures and so they've they've developed them into cities and there's the, the cities will hold up to 65,000 people each. And Pete said that the original plan of the deep state was to have a nuclear war, which again, it's never going to happen. The positive ETs will prevent that. But they were going to have a nuclear war, and then after the subs shot off their ordnance, they would then plug themselves into these sockets that are secretly located at various places on the ocean seabed around the world on the edge of our, uh, our continent right where these cities are located. So these sockets represent like power outlets for the different 225 cities that we have underground. And you're not going to use all of them. You're just going to use the ones that, you know, where the subs are plugged in and where everybody decided to go. So they don't have enough supplies to, to house 65,000 people in all 225 of them, so I was told, but they could move supplies around from one to the other because all of these different cities are connected by a vast system called the sub-shuttle system, which is essentially a pneumatic capsule, an egg-like capsule, that shoots you through at a very high speed. And Pete said that there was a vomit hole that you'd have to lean forward into, because sometimes you'd get so sick from this, from shooting through this tunnel. So, one of the other things that Pete Peterson told me was that there's thousands and thousands of spaceships that we have, uh, we as in humanity, and they're out there on various places, the moon and Mars, and that many of them were designed by, and, and, and actually the original design was made by Chris Beskar. So from the beginning, he was always telling me I needed to get in touch with Chris Beskar, I need to talk to this guy, I need, we need to connect. And I wasn't really sure about that because Chris was running this military company and he wanted me to be a part of the company and he was doing fighter jets. And I said, well, you know, what's going to happen if I'm out there and all these haters can now say, oh, oh, you know, he's working on this military equipment. So the offer was placed in front of me. I met Chris in 2009. Uh, I was very impressed. And he had a bunch of insider stories that he's still not ready to talk about yet, but eventually he will. And Pete's experience was of meeting extraterrestrials in person in these various underground facilities. So this was a commonplace thing. And apparently everybody in the higher levels of aerospace has been through this. We have joint human extraterrestrial bases that already exist now. And Peterson told me over and over again as the years went by that there was new construction going on under the White House. This always was very strange new construction going on under the White House to create living quarters for 35 different races of extraterrestrial. Now, why are they doing that? Pete told me the reason they were building these underground facilities for 35 different types of extraterrestrials is because there is an anticipated future moment where they are going to introduce themselves to us as a planet. And one of the really weird, proprietary, strange things that you hear, which is like, well, I've never heard that before, was he said that some of these people are not going to be visible to us unless you have a certain type of light on in the room. And we say light, but it's emitting some other frequencies that are outside of anything we normally use. And you have to beam these frequencies at these people in order to get this ghost-like silhouette of them that we can then see and interact with. That's how they would normally be, is invisible to us, but then you have this special light and it makes them visible. And so some of the groups that we're gonna meet when they do this are actually on this light. Now, another one of the really, really bizarre things that he said was that there were, there was an, at least one insect race that's not negative, it's actually positive, but they evolved out of insects. Um, there's at least a, a praying mantis type and at least an ant type that we know of, uh, that, that for sure. And of course, they have all kinds of strange colloquial names for these people. They call them the grasshoppers or the crickets. That was another term I heard a lot. But apparently these people, in order to sleep, they have this hook that comes out of the wall 
and then they kind of they notch their back into the hook because their back is very thin. It's made of uh, this chitin exoskeleton type of thing. So they actually sleep standing up and they just kind of slot their back into this clip. And then once they get clipped, they just fall asleep. And the equivalent of that in nature for an insect would be on the joint of some type of vegetable, you know, that he, he, he hinges his back into the joint between uh, uh, two branches, let's say. Well, they create that for you in the, in the base. So the whole entire basis of what Pete was telling me was that we as, as humanity have been very involved in developing this technology, exploring space, learning about other cultures, learning about other races, exploring artifacts that are from within our own solar system and planet, developing that technology and working with these various ETs behind the scenes, positive and negative ones. Now there are some parts of our military industrial complex that actually did make deals with the bad guys. That's unfortunately all too common. And so that's where in our new movie, Levitation, we have some very stunning new footage from Michael Herrera, who was the witness in Greer's latest round of insiders talking about human trafficking. That there was this octagonal black UFO and they saw bodies being loaded into it. Bodies were no longer alive, but they were human. So that's pretty alarming stuff. And yes, that's part of the story. But then there's also a very positive part of the story. When Pete met up with various human looking ETs, they all kept telling him the same thing. They said that the galaxy was going to take on human form as Jesus, okay? And so it starts to get evangelical. Whoa, 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 the Bible, what? Yeah, that's what they said. That they had come here because usually the galaxy does not take on human form. That Jesus is the embodiment of the galactic logos, galactic personality, but that normally it doesn't actually ever show up in, an, in a fully embodied human form. So that's a very weird and exciting thing that was why these beings said they were here. So it was at that point that I started to understand that there's some very biblical stuff going on here. This is a, the scope of this thing is very wide. And these, he, Pete talked to me extensively about various types of tall whites, quote unquote. And again, this is a, a highly, highly confusing and contradictory term because first of all, all it really means is that it was a category that these various insiders would use to talk colloquially about a certain type of extraterrestrial that was human and tall and had whiter skin. So they just call them tall whites. But, you know, there's, there's certainly many different types of tall whites and not just one. And some of them are much more human than others. So... There's a lot of different names for the human ETs, but in, as the briefings have gone on, I learned that it's a pretty commonly shared view in the inside, or it's a universally shared view, I guess, that, these are, that most of the human ETs visiting us come from the planet Venus, or that at least they can live there among other places, and that they exist in their natural form as orbs of pure energy, but that they can project into a human body. And this is probably the same type that would be able to have that light shined on them, whatever the light is. But Pete also told me that the Valiant Thor story was actually a projection of one of these beings from Venus, that it was real, and that that contact paved the way for something called the plan, which was a plan to arrest the deep state, expose them, and then we have the galactic family reunion. And apparently they were already building the facilities to get ready for this back when Pete was talking to me in 2010 about this. They were constructing these vast underground facilities around the White House. I don't think anybody has access to them now. I don't know. But they're very secretive classified facilities, but they are going to be used supposedly. There's going to be this realization that, hey, we've never been alone. These people have been visiting us the whole time. They built the ancient Stargate system. Your address is 606. Hey, everybody, here we are. We never really left. There's been stargates on Earth the whole time. There's been people coming and going, extraterrestrials coming and going from your Earth, working with your governments, both positively and negatively, the whole time. It's not like this all just started with Roswell. 
The DS people have been working with these ETs the entire time. That was one of the things Henry Deacon told me, that there was Stargates going back 10,000 years or more from Atlantis and that they've never stopped being used. We just don't know where they are and we don't realize what's happening. Then there was uh, Jacob, another insider I met in 2010 around the same time as Peterson, and he told me, yeah, there's Draco reptilians landing their craft cloaked on the White House lawn every day and having meetings about how they're controlling the planet. That was very, very bizarre. As I spoke to Dr. Pete Peterson, though, I found out about the Alliance, and even in his original interview with Project Camelot, he spoke about what was going on. He said, and he told me much more detail about it after the fact, that there was a very, very elaborate amount of technology and know-how on the inside with these secret government projects and that they were in communication with these benevolent human ETs from Venus. And we talk extensively about the Venus connection in Michael prophecies. When I did the research on the 1950s contactees, many of them said that the humans they were meeting with were coming from Venus. So that was fascinating when I followed up on that and got the confirmation. And I wanted to keep this around an hour and a half, so we're already getting pretty close to the edge here. Uh, but anyway, these humans from Venus Valiant Thor being one of them, designed with this very high-level classified military intelligence group, something that Pete called the plan. Howard Hughes was very, very involved in this. There are all these clones of Howard Hughes because he built these military facilities that require his eye ocular print in order for the door to open. And he built the security so well that instead of trying to figure out how to crack it when he died, they just started cloning him. So Howard Hughes was very powerful. In fact, they thought he was too powerful. He had all this classified hardware, extraterrestrial retrieved technology under his control, bases under his control. You know, there's a whole exit off of the 405 called Howard Hughes Parkway. Nobody else has that. So he also started to get burned on all these military contracts and said there's gotta be something going on. That's what led to him investigating the cabal through using women who were sex couriers, where they would seduce men and trick them into giving them information that was then used uh, against them. So this is also why, like, please, nobody should ever come to my house. And it just happened again this past week, and I typically call it a stalker incident when it does. I have no trespassing signs up. It is illegal when you post no trespassing signs on prop private property. It is illegal to cross them regardless of whether you think you found something and you think it's the right address, okay? So I have been told to expect that somebody would come and that it would be an operation and that it would not be what it looks like. So I have to assume if anybody shows up at my house that it's highly threatening. I've had multiple briefings about this. I am not allowed to ignore it, okay? And if <laughs> you don't believe that I've had multiple briefings as if I need to do this, but okay, look, what do we got right here? We got a, two challenge coins. One of these is from an army general. Let's see if I can get that in focus. Yeah, there it is. And one of these is, this is an iron eagle. Okay, so you can't, you can't get coins like these from people unless this guy's a general and this guy's a colonel in the Navy. Okay, um, or Air Force rather. Wait a minute, this is Navy. I gotta get this right. Air Force colonel, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm crazy. Anyway. That's the kind of stuff that happens when you talk to real insiders. They give you challenge coins. We're going to start making our own here pretty quick. It's Stavati challenge coins. But this is not fake. And so, again, the insiders have told me that I have to suspect that if anybody comes here, that it's a murder, actually. And so, please do not come to my house. You will be considered a security threat, and I have to deal with it as such. So I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be excited. I'm not going to be thrilled about it. I have to assume that this is a subterfuge of some kind. So <laughs> I'm going to try to do more events, and I'm, I want to speak to you one-on-one -on -one like this, but please don't try to have in-person contact. I haven't had anybody here, not my family, not friends, no romance. Okay, so I'm not looking for anybody to come and move in or, or hang out or show up. <laughs> this is what you get right now, and I'm sorry if, if you want more, but that's what we got. If you want to do more with me, you can apply for a job with the company because we're going to be hiring a lot of people. 
But again, uh, Peterson tells me that ever since the 1950s, Howard Hughes started to learn about the deep state and that information percolated into this military industrial complex, which then began having a revolutionary breakaway from the cabal. And this has been going on this whole time. And so what we're seeing now is the result of something that's been building up since the time of JFK and before. JFK just kind of stepped into something that was already underway since the 1950s. So the plan has always been to restore some type of sanity to this world because people just didn't know that they were being controlled. They didn't know they were slaves. They didn't know they were under control. They didn't know what was really going on. They didn't know that there's this very, very dark stuff happening and that this group has been trying to lower how many people are here for a long time. And they're gonna get really aggressive about it. And they have plans to go as far as they can. That's what nuclear war was all about. Let's just get the population way down, <coughs> shoot off all these things, take the old submarines, plug them into the underground cities, and now we can live down there or off planet and we're happy. In the meantime, we'll just let the earth settle on the surface. They really were thinking this way. These people are crazy. So again, it's gonna be noteworthy to bring this back. Quotes from Pete's original interview with Project Camelot. And this is the transcript that, you know, you can type that in, it's still there. He said about where he was living, I'm at an area that had two requirements for me and for some of the people who I do various things for that are not to be named. One of them is this area is very secluded from man-made electromagnetic radiation. It's deep in a valley with high mountains surrounding at 360 degrees. I have a similar thing. The entrance is through a very narrow, long winding canyon, so we don't really get radio or television here directly. And the power that comes in has interference on it as well as information on it, but it's very secluded informationally. Then the place that I chose here is kind of back in a little notch in the mountains, so it's even more secluded. That was one reason. The other reason is I'm in an area that's very defendable. That was very important because of my belief and the belief of many other people that I have great respect for that the world is going through, I'll call it a meltdown. Now remember, he was saying this stuff in 2009. And what we're seeing now is much more of a fulfillment of this prophecy than we had in 2009. I've been led to believe in numerous briefings and people I know in fields that very definitely would know and so forth. They've all warned me that I should be living at a place like this. Many people, even those from Europe and other places that had very heavy financial connections in major cities around the world have closed their offices down. A great number of them have expressed a desire to move here if they haven't already moved here. I moved here because I was told by various people that I should geolocate and be in an area that would be safe when we eventually, here it is, get a financial and political collapse. So there are certain things I've done to make sure that myself and my family and my friends are safe from that anticipated collapse. Well, we're seeing it now. We've heard that things are going to happen, things are going to fail, but life continued on as normal, and the government continued printing money and passing it out to his friends. I moved here in 1999 because I was told that by 2001, the system was going to fail. And here we are eight or nine years later, and Bill Ryan says, in fact, you were ordered to come here, and he says, I was. So Pete actually had a tip off about 9-11 before it ever happened. And he was told that they were expecting it was gonna to lead to the collapse of civilization. So that's much, much more than what actually did occur. And again, he said in this interview that uh, no, it didn't fail. We found out it didn't collapse after 2001. I'd go in for a briefing and they'd just be in shock. We don't know how the world has kept on going after we did this. We have no idea why it hasn't failed. We just don't know. The only thing we can do is say there is so much inertia. Well, it's actually more than inertia. It's angelic guidance and protection. So he says, now it's beginning to fail and not just beginning, but on a logarithmic scale. And very shortly, I see it has to do that. And this was in 2009, once again. But he also gave us the answer, okay? He said, I've put my money and my talent, my skills and my abilities where my mouth is. I've come here and I'm self-sufficient. I grow my own meat, my own vegetables. I've stored up the things. He's a prepper, you know, critical society. I've picked up the tools that I didn't have to allow me to do things in such an environment, in such a society to produce things that will be necessary for people to have. So what happens is if we have a financial collapse, it won't be like the 20s, it's going to be like today. 
They're going to have anarchy and absolute chaos. The government knows that. They've been trying to get this to happen. They recently asked service members if they would fire on civilians if they were asked to, which is entirely against the Constitution. And those who said no were then moved to different military bases, and the bases were then decommissioned. So as Pete told me the story, he said that these people realized what happened. This is the alliance. They began working together to try to make sure that this dark plan did not succeed. He said, I can't imagine anyone accepting the job of the president in the current situation. I can't even imagine that. And then he said about Obama, when, he, when Obama got his first briefing, I had friends who were present. He was so shocked he had to sit down when he found out what was really happening. And this was before he took the office. Pete went into way more detail later on. I've talked about this before. This is when, right before Obama took office, he's meeting with the former presidents and he's talking right there to George Bush Sr. And Bush Sr. looks very, very nervous. And, and apparently when he shook Obama's hand, oops, when he shook Obama's hand, he had uh, a handkerchief in it. This is public record. And then they have this private meeting. Obama and Bush Sr. had this private meeting that lasted for 45 minutes. And apparently, Bush Sr. starts laying all this racist invective against Obama, uh, including the use of the N-word, which is highly inappropriate. I would never, ever do that under any circumstances. It's just insane. This guy's evil. Yelling at Obama, and Obama apparently was told that he is under control. There's this whole global thing going on. He's not really the president at all. He's going to do exactly what they effing say. And if you don't like it, F you. So he ended up going outside this meeting and crying, and various people saw that. So this was uh, the question that then led up to this. Would you confirm that there are good people who we have euphemistically called the white hats? And again, this has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It's just a weird old term. I don't know why they still use it and the government and the intelligence and military who themselves are patriots as you are, and they're trying to do their best from the inside to avert these disasters. And he said, absolutely. There are many people who left the military. Most of the good people left during Clinton and Bush. They couldn't pledge allegiance to the president because of the things that were being done, so many people left. On the other hand, this is the big part here, folks. There were many people who stayed behind because they knew they were going to be needed. They sacrificed, not principle, but they had a higher knowledge and they stayed behind so that they could apply the knowledge they had when the time came. This is about as critical of a phrase as you could ever see because this is what is happening now. So the things that are going on in the world, to the vast majority of people, they really do not understand at all what is going on. But all of the stuff that surrounds the operations that we see now and the exposures that we see now and all this very complex storyline that you've heard me talk about many times before, having to do with certain letter that might be in the alphabet and when those posts occurred, okay, this is not fake. It never was fake. I heard about it in 2009. I started reporting on it. I started writing articles on it in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15 and 16, and those posts didn't appear till 17. Because when I found out what was going on, I said, well, these hardly anybody's ever heard about this, what these guys are doing and where this is really going. Because the whole point was that to get us out of enslavement by negative extraterrestrials. And the, the main form of enslavement that we have is being stuck here on Earth and not allowed to go into space. That's the main form of enslavement we have. When a negative extraterrestrial group like the Draco Reptilians comes to a planet like this, they want to lock it down. Lockdowns are not just something that happened beginning in 2020. That's the way that the negative likes it. They want you working for them. They want you providing slavery and food. <laughs> but they certainly don't want you leaving. They don't want you going anywhere else. And unfortunately, as badass as our own technology has been on the very deep inside track, it hadn't been enough to fight back until fairly recently. So Pete also told me that there is a war going on with these negative ETs and that it is going to lead to this moment of truth that's going to lead to some type of exposure where, again, they've already got the facilities built under the White House for 35 different races. He told me about this in so much detail. If you have trouble believing it, I understand. It's, it's a big ask, but... 
You talk to all these people and so many of their stories interconnect, and this is just where I was by 2010. I didn't even start working for Gaia until 2013, and by that point, most of the major insiders I'd met, I'd already seen, I'd already published their material in thousands and thousands of pages of stuff, many, many hours of radio and video and conference material. It's a vastly intricate, interconnected system of information. And so again, when you look at what's going on, what I call the alliance, it's very important to see how much deeper this really is than what most people think. You, you want to get beyond politics and really go into something that's much deeper than this. So let's take it to uh, here. Another thing that I found out, going back again, there may be less than 3,000 people on Earth who even really have a need to know about what the heck is really going on here. Only 3,000. And so it's a very fascinating thing to find out that, you know, the so-called Illuminati, no matter how far up the chain you go in that pyramid, people have seen various illustrations of pyramids and, oh, well, there's this group and there's that group. But I'm telling you, almost no one whatsoever in the group that's here on Earth that would be called that name has any contact with the space program at all. Apparently, according to Jacob, who, who, who did meet with Pete in person and they compared notes and they were both on the same page, and Jacob also met with Henry Deacon in person at my house in California, and they were out in the backyard, they had a long conversation, and they definitely were talking about the same stuff. There's not very many people. Another one who was actually on the inside of all this and, and never leaked anywhere near what he knew was Major Robert Dean. Bob Dean's real story was much, much deeper and he wanted to come forward, but then that never was able to happen. He wanted to tell a lot more than he ever had. But he'd been in all the same stuff as Uncle Jack and Jacob, you know, Jacob Uncle Jack, as Pete Peterson, Henry Deacon, they all had been through the same stuff. So very few, this is one of the things that they really need to learn, okay? You could even be as far along as one of the Clintons and never get shown any of this stuff. Bill Clinton was out there saying he tried to poke into the UFO subject as president, and he got nowhere. And I wouldn't expect Hillary to have gotten much farther. You can literally get that far up the chain, and they are never going to tell you anything at all. And then they might get sassy and be like, well, David Wilcock, duh, 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 duh. how did I know? How does he know all of it? Well, look, it's just a question of talking to the right people. And that's what they told me, is that there's this revolutionary schism that's occurred on the inside where we have different groups. Uh, somebody just said in the comments how much LSD is required to see aliens. Uh, David, you are amazing. I want to work for you. We have to do our work to heal ourselves and our planet. We become our own saviors through understanding and reaching our higher selves through understanding God. I would agree with that. How much LSD is required to see aliens? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to use that method at all. Honestly, like dropping a psychedelic substance and then asking to see a being is probably a very bad idea. A very bad idea. Ambassador Saul said, this guy thinks his thoughts are worth money. Well, okay, we're back to the rate objection again. That's fine. What is the name of your company? I have a master's graduate in bioinformatics and skills and data analytics, Python, da, da, da. Does your, yeah, we might need that. So again, uh, be on the lookout for our website coming up here. We're, we're going to be developing it out a lot more in the new year. We did get a really stunning breakthrough, so I'm not worried about money anymore. I mean, we don't have it yet, but Levitation is going to be out in three or four months, and once that happens, it conquers all my money problems, as long as you guys go see it. And again, it's not going to be very expensive, but in the process of watching that film, you're going to really, really help us out tremendously. So... That business model may be the one that really carries me through here. And again, if you'd like the full-blown information, the 10 and a half hour video course with seven camera angles, high production value, that's available now at thedisclosure.com. It's the finest collection of all this sacred science and tying together the Michael message. Because what Michael ended up telling me is that they are coming back. The ETs are coming back. These human ETs I've been talking about, they're definitely coming back. 
Emily Howard says, we need hover cars for the snow. John Brewer, are you David on Telegram? I said that before, I am not uh, on Telegram. There's, there's all kinds of uh, weird stuff out there, including impersonations and hate, and you know. So there's, there's just a lot of things out there that are gonna try to tell you they're me and they're really not. I, all I do is Twitter. I don't do Facebook anymore. I've, I've never really done any other social media. I'm not that into it because everybody tries to hunt me down. And there's a lot of really angry and mean people on social media too. So, you know, I'm just not all that interested. Sorry. What else? Go natural, try mushrooms. What happened to the ones you found from the fairy ring? <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that right now. Those were, those were Amanita muscaria. They have the red caps and the white dots. And that is traditionally associated with an opiate. So if you take them in a microdose level, it's a, it's a really big kind of downer type of experience. And the ceremonial dosage of Amanita is, is considered like one of the worst trips there is. There's a lot of vomiting. And then people apparently hallucinate beings both large and small. So no thank you. Don't want to do any of that stuff. Anyway, getting back to our slide again here, there was this revolutionary schism that has now led to this alliance forming as a result of ongoing human ET interactions. As I said, there's a complete separation between the cabal on space and the cabal on Earth. Another one of the really revolting things you hear is that the whole continent of Africa apparently was promised to the Draco Empire. Hey, why not? Let's just give them that. So there was apparently some type of treaty with the, you know, the Rothschild elements of this and the deep space program. So he was telling me, Jacob, that these guys are actually involved in that too, but that the rest of the organization knows nothing about it. So you have everybody below them here on earth who are all part of one thing and they think they know everything, but they don't know anything about the space stuff. They've never been through a Stargate. They've never seen a real extraterrestrial. They might've seen lower astrals, but they haven't seen real extraterrestrials. They're not being invited to go. Nobody cares. We're, we're, we're like slaves to these negative ETs, but then we, the Rothschild folks, whoever they are, apparently promised these guys that they would be able to inhabit Africa and they could terraform it and, you know, build their own atmosphere that has a lot more oil in it than we do. We couldn't breathe it because of the oil, but it's better and more comfortable for them, apparently. So that's just some of the really scary stuff you hear. We also hear them saying, your gold, your water, or your women. And this was, you know, the classic line of like, well, they are pirates, they're here to plunder us. And so these are the things that they're after, just like we saw in the television show, V the Visitors. Let's have a few more comments here. Too many commercials in a live, sorry, I have no, look, if I don't actually use ads, I have no protection, you'd never be able to see this. So you gotta kind of wink with me and understand that I have to have ads turned on or else this show would never happen, all right? Ah, oh, let's see. Dark space program did that? Draconians can't have Africa. Their empire is huge. Well, no, they don't have any land. That's the problem. They wanted to have a place to live and they wanted to be Africa. And so that's not going to be allowed to occur. But the, the DS apparently did a number of things beginning in 1976 to prepare Africa for colonization. And first they had to, you know, try to get rid of everybody. But that's not happening. So uh, again, these treaties have all been nullified. Um, oh, somebody, Brandon, donated $5. Thank you. And he said, will there be on-the-job training with your new company? I really need to change in career. This is right up my alley. Yes. This is a big part of what's turning into the agenda that is 47. And I just want to be careful in how I delineate that. That agenda thing is, is going to be involving 10 different cities being built and going into the next level of aerospace. So this is what I'm trying to tell you folks. The people who are behind all the stuff that you know and love, the people who have been making this happen, fighting for freedom, getting us to where we need to go as a planet, it all came out of the deep black. It all came out of the UFOs. It all came out of the, the area where, again, they have a base with 10,000 10, people born on Earth but 200,000 personnel. <laughs> and again, Pete told me that there's 65 different off-planet locations that we're seeing throughout uh, where there are American military personnel, supposedly, throughout our galaxy. 
A lot of times it's giant spheres that were left behind by the Draco Empire. He told me that we have these uh, stargates that are little moons that are artificial, and you can go in there and have 3,500 people working and living in that little sphere. And it was an old Stargate system, and the Draco just completely threw it away. It's their garbage. But that's one of the things that we've now done, enabling us to colonize the galaxy. So as I, as I started to research all this more and more, I realized the whole story is surprisingly biblical. You know, you have evil ETs that sound a lot like the devil, and they're doing all the kind of things the devil wants you to do. You have positive ETs projecting in the human form. They're using UFOs as time machines. But we didn't really know about this galactic family reunion and all the details until the Michael prophecies, this contact I just went through for the last two years. And the secrets are much greater than almost anybody can imagine. All right, so now I want to make sure that we get to our global peace meditation. And in order that you guys don't all like drop off here, let's see how many we have. Oh, we got 6,000 people right now. So could you do me a favor and please don't hang up as we do the meditation. I'm only going to do five minutes, but this is the most number we've had this far in the game. So I'm going to just do five minutes, but let's do this together now. And this is going to help really ease all the problems in the world. I feel obligated to use this technology every time. So here we go. I'd like you to close your eyes now. Put both feet flat on the floor. Take a nice deep breath. Keep on breathing. All right, let me get into this space with you. Going deeper and deeper now into the silence. Letting yourself breathe in. And then as you exhale, just feel yourself going farther and farther away. More and more into yourself. What is the reality of extraterrestrial life? Are we, in fact, on the verge of a spectacular galactic family reunion? And what will happen once we reach that place? The Michael Prophecies tells us that there will be untold numbers of men, women, and children, these higher beings who we will meet, who have been with us all along. And we will realize that we have always been safe. They are preventing nuclear war. They are protecting us from all sorts of very, very upsetting, frightening, and dangerous things. And we are learning through each and every step how to become more alive to learn to breathe in the magnificent energy of the cosmos, to breathe it through our bodies, to exhale it outward, to activate the inner light, the energetic activation of our true selves and who we really are. Going even deeper now. Feeling so perfectly relaxed, so at peace, that there is no need to be concerned about anything at all. Keeping ourselves alive and happy, sustaining our nutrition through breath, through eating the right foods, drinking the proper water, and maintaining a conscious Attitude of love, gratitude, happiness, patience, forgiveness, and thanksgiving. We no longer need to repeat the mistakes that categorized so many failed opportunities in our past. We no longer need to feel as if our lives are 
spiraling out of control, that all of this is heading in some negative and scary direction. We are learning and understanding for ourselves now that we are moving into a new type of existence. Michael's message is that there is an energetic activation taking place. And as we go into the dark night of the soul on a planetary level, there is similarly an implosion occurring within our cosmic self. And we are having that world expand just like the raisin bread. Our own consciousness is becoming greater than it was and our dream landscape is getting larger. And the world will get larger too. The boundaries that we used to define Earth as ending with will no longer be relevant. We will see that there are angelic hosts from all throughout the universe who have come here and visited us seeking to make their presence known, seeking to give us hope in a situation that can seem entirely hopeless giving us reasons to believe in the ancient promises told in so many scriptures and spiritual works, that we are the light, we are the love, and we are the one infinite creator. Let us take this energy that we've raised as we meditate ever so deeply and send that energy out into the world. Send it out to all those in need of prayer and healing, all those who might be suffering or feeling pain, knowing once and for all that the changes we are going through in the world are not random, they are not chaotic, they are not unpredictable. This is a perfect plan designed by higher intelligence whose end point is the graduation of every living person on earth into the higher Fourth density reality, not just 144,000 who go through ascension or rapture, but humanity as a whole, refined, able to become something more than it ever had been before, a new form of life, a new civilization, new wonders waiting for us inside the earth, in the moon, on Mars, and throughout our solar system, an almost irresistible temptation to want to go out there and see what is the face on Mars? What are the pyramids? Who lived there? What did they build? What artifacts did they leave behind? What can we find for our own time? And how can we implement this knowledge for the betterment of humanity? Can we release these forbidden technologies and bring about the world that we really want to see? And I believe that answer is yes. As we breathe here and now, we are co-creating this future together, where there is a perfect solution through all of this apparent chaos and misery and pain. And that solution involves us being more relaxed, and learning to breathe, and just letting go of all of these stacks of concerns that so typically seem to define the pattern of our thoughts each and every day. We're learning to have a greater understanding, learning to love one another. And when we do, the universe prepares a path for us to graduation, a path where within our lifetime, we have the most spectacular changes that could have ever possibly been anticipated. And this is not supposition. It's not speculation. It is the future. It is the future that we are going to be heading into in a very short period of time. The events that are going to happen on Earth will be the most fantastic events in human history, dwarfing any other previous ET contacts that religions were created out of. Everyone will know with absolute certainty that we are not alone and that these humans have always been there for us and that they are benevolent and kind and they've always had our best interest in mind. We do believe that this is coming sooner than you may even want to imagine. And the best way to prepare again is to seek the peace of the moment, to seek to be as loving as possible, to be as compassionate and forgiving as possible. So one more time, we breathe this healing energy out into the world. 
to all those areas where there's conflict, strife, and struggle. Let's visualize a peaceful, easy solution. As you exhale, just breathe that beautiful peace into the world. Sealing it, making it as so it is. Amen. Now I'd like you to breathe your way back into the room, start wiggling your fingers and toes. When you're ready, you can start to open up your eyes. Woo, there we go. I actually kept it under two hours. I'm happy about that. And we only lost 400 people, so... You know, okay, no harm, no no foul, you know. Thank you guys for still hanging in there with us. Um, yeah, so we've had some really great things happen with the company. I'm not worried anymore. Uh, there's there's some loans that have lined up at different levels of size. I really do think last week telling you about my troubles was a very important part of acknowledging what had happened. When I went to college for psychology, they tell us communication can solve all of our problems. That was one of the things that every psychology class kept saying. If you would just communicate, it could solve all your problems. And so many things would be better off than they are. So I encourage you to communicate. I encourage you to communicate with yourselves and with each other and just be honest. You know, honesty is so important right now to look honestly at your shortcomings, things that you might not like about yourself and say, you know what? I'm willing to let that go. I'm willing to let that go. And where can I change? Where can I be? A better version of myself. That's my meditation. That's what I'm always doing. I'm always trying to find ways to improve. And that includes wearing a pink shirt for you. I mean, hell, I threw down. This doesn't just happen every day. When you get this kind of amazing circuitry of clothing that comes in and just is delivered across this entire spectrum of cameras, I mean, oh my God, it is love at first sight. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you come to the house and you think that you're going to fall in love, but that's just not the way it works. you got to keep it on the screen. Okay, you can just touch the screen and you'll be happy. Maybe. I don't know. Some people want more than that. But anyway, there were some questions on there about jobs with our company. Yes, as I was starting to say with the Agenda 47 thing there, I just went through all of them. You see that? <laughs> the Agenda 47 thing is very cool because there's a lot of high technology that's going to be built. We're going to learn that the group that's been saving us that's within the military has all this technology and they're just trying to figure out how to let us know about that and how to not shock the world. People say, oh, well, this is not in the Bible. Yeah, well, it actually is. You just have to understand what's really going on. That's where the Michael prophecies come in. So once again, thedisclosure.com is the website. And I want to thank you guys for watching. I guess I will sign off now. And I think I have to wait something like 30 seconds before I actually hit the stop button in order for you to see the whole thing. That's the only bad part about my show. So I've, I've tightened that up. And anyway, uh, we're going to end it for right now. I'll wait the awkward 30 seconds and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.